Hey guys, it's Coffee. Welcome back to Socrates Jones. Uh, so I'm hoping in this episode we might be able to find out more about the actual, the, the real Socrates. Because uh, the Arbiter mentioned something about how he disappeared, and he's kind of a mystery right now. So, I don't know, maybe we'll get into that this time. Uh, anyway, let's start Chapter 3, The Social Contract. Well, the original Socrates may have, may have bested the Arbiter's challenge, but that's two philosophers down, and I don't feel any closer to our goal. It always seems to be just out of reach, doesn't it? Do not worry. There are still near infinite perspectives to examine. In fact, I already have another philosopher ready for you to debate. Wonderful. So, who's the next philosopher? Is it another Greek dude? Because, frankly, I'm getting sick of Greek dudes. No, this one's British. Oh, how exciting! Yes, I am simply ecstatic. What's the matter, Socrates? Do you no longer wish to continue? I guess we have no other choice. Hold on, I never said that. Of course I wish to continue. Dad. Very well then. Give me a moment, Socrates, and I will bring you the new philosopher out. Uh, hello? <laughs> um, hello? Um, Arbiter, are you sure this is the right guy? He isn't doing anything. Maybe he's dead? Well, technically- Humbug! Oh, he can speak? Of course I can speak, you silly girl. I just choose not to. You waste time with small words, and small words are the money of fools. Uh, Arbiter, who is this guy? You may refer to me as Thomas Hobbes. You should know, Mr. Jones, that my mother gave birth to twins, myself, and fear. Oh shit, this guy's not fucking around. By the end of the day, you will be thoroughly acquainted with both of us. Well, geez, isn't he a dramatic one? Hobbes, you may present your argument. Of course, Arbiter. Allow me to begin my by describing to you the natural state of man. In the natural state, men find themselves equal and in competition for resources. Being selfish, they will go to any lengths to achieve their desires. This, set it, this sets them at odds with every other man, creating a constant state of war. Ceaseless conflicts makes life nasty, brutish, and short. And there we go, the natural state of mankind. Okay, the natural state. Mankind is selfish. But wait, you said nothing about morality. Of course not. In the natural state, there is no morality. There is nothing binding us to respect one another. Nothing stopping us from killing each other. What? Well, that's depressing. And ridiculous. Of course there's a sense of right and wrong. Arbiter, there is no way this philosophy can possibly be the correct answer. Hm. You seem rather sure of yourself, Mr. Jones. Shall we put your theory to the test? Gladly. People work together. Okay. Careful. Okay, so I'm gonna look at our idea slate real quick. Alright. So, we have natural state. According to Hobbes, in the natural state, every man is in constant war with others. Okay. Okay, mankind is selfish. Hobbes believes that man will always seek the greatest benefit of the self. And then people work together. People often help each other in order to further the overall good. Hmm, okay. So I'm assuming we'll probably have to use people work together, maybe, as, um, like maybe to contradict being at war with others? Or I guess greatest benefit to self. Uh, we'll see. Hmm. Being selfish through what angles to achieve their desires. Sets them at odds with every other man. Okay, I think this is where we use people work together, right? Nonsense! Hobbes, your argument here is about as weak as they come. 
You claim that people are in constant state of war, but I see people cooperate every day. Is that so? Yes. Societies are, in fact, built upon such cooperation. Employees in a business collaborate to, to create a product. Construction workers get together to build a house. Police work together to take, down, to take down criminals. Philosophers work together to find the truth. Exactly. Thank you, Arbiter. Well, Thomas Hobbes, if people were always at war, none of these things would be possible. Society as we know it couldn't exist. What do you have to say to that? I say that you are merely an observer of the obvious, Mr. Jones. Huh? You insult my intelligence. Do you really think I hadn't considered such things? Our sense of morality is what allows us to cooperate in such a fashion. But, but wait, hold on, you said earlier there was no morality. Indeed, in this natural state, this is true. However, as such a state is, is extremely uncomfortable, we have long since moved beyond it. Allow me to explain to you, Mr. Jones, the step you have missed. What? At the core of mankind's self-interest is survival. However, in the natural state, there is no security. Thus, mankind is impelled to seek peace, forming contracts between individuals. It is from such exchanges that our sense of morality is born. Okay, interesting. And there you have it. Our moral rules, our society, our political systems, they all come from the social contract. A very compelling argument, indeed. Yeah, and it's one I've actually read about, too. How did this happen? I thought for sure we were ready to move on. <sighs> you walked right into that one, Dad. Helped him set it up in everything. Hobbes is one of the most prominent social contract philosophers. It's only natural he took his argument in this direction. What? You knew this? Why didn't you warn me? Sorry, I just assumed you already knew. Well, don't next time. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of... It's not uncommon knowledge, you know? Is there a problem, Socrates? Or are you ready to accept the truth of my argument? Well, his argument seems pretty solid now, that's for sure. But something built on a premise so grim. I can't just accept it without examination. Arbiter, I'd like to ask Mr. Hobbes a few questions. Bah! Scholastic thinking, I hardly see the attraction in it. Come now, Hobbes. Very well, Mr. Jones. Give it a shot. Let's see how it goes. Okay. Let's see. The natural state, there's no security. Um, okay, I guess that makes sense. Because I'm about to see the peace. Hmm. Maybe we can ask for clarification on this one? What exactly do you mean by contracts? Indeed. This could use some elaboration. Very well. By contract, I refer to, the, to an agreement between individuals. In such contracts, we agreed to give up some of our personal freedoms, most notably our freedom to harm. Because others do as well, such an argument confers onto everyone greater, onto everyone greater security. Huh. Interesting. Oh, okay, we have another thing now. Need for security. Okay, wait, so... Natural state, there's no security... Okay. Thus we form contracts agreeing to give up freedoms in exchange for security. And then, it is from the exchange that our sense of morality is born. Okay, that makes sense, because he's saying that, like... We can actually do anything we, we want or feel like. But... Because of society, we limit ourselves. Or, I guess to live in a society, we limit ourselves. Um, okay, so what's on our what's on our list here? Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so he's saying that um, 
He made a point that mankind is selfish, but if mankind is so selfish, why would uh, why would we give up our own uh, freedoms in our contracts? I think it's what I need to. Um, I think it's what I need to do here. Nonsense! Ooh, okay. I think I got it. Hold it right there, Hobbs. I'll admit, the individual parts of your philosophy sound good on paper, but they don't work quite so well when viewed as a whole. Is that so? Do explain. Gladly. Your social contract theory is based on the idea that people are selfish, correct? Indeed. And that they will go to any lengths to improve their own prosperity. Correct. Which is why contracts must be formed. I am a little confused. What exactly is the problem, Socrates? Isn't it apparent by now? If the only benefits of the social contract come from other people giving up their rights, and people are as selfish as you claim, what is there to stop these oh-so-selfish individuals from breaking a contract after it's made? Yes! Nice. Why, that is a very good question. Working off Hobbes' own theory of human nature, men will always, always seek the most ad advantageous situation. Well, the most advantageous situation for anyone would be that they keep their rights and when others give them up. So, why would people ever keep their contracts? They wouldn't? Of course not. Everyone would stab each other in the back the moment they could get away with it. Hobbes, your ideas, taken all together, are self-defeating. There is no way the social contract could be formed in the way you described. Nonsense. Mr. Jones, you are getting carried away. Ha, huh, I think I've made some good points. Me too. Laughter is nothing more than a reaction to sudden glory, Mr. Jones. And in your case, the glory you are reacting to is quite artificial. What? All of these things you are saying, they have occurred to me. They are, in fact, the obvious progression of thought. The fact that any self-interested man would break his contract is a problem. Which is why I came up with the next step of the thought process. The next step? Okay. Without obligations, selfish individuals are indeed likely to break the contract. However, such obligation can easily be created by fear. Namely, fear of repercussions. This fear can, in turn, be created by empowering a sovereign. Such a ruler could then deal out punishments to those who break the contract. And as a result, the moral systems of the contract would remain intact. And there we go. As you see, Mr. Jones, my philosophy is quite sustainable. The social contract simply needs proper enforcement. Okay, contracts need to be enforced. Cool. You know what? I think I actually missed talking to you, Fifero. Dad, are you... going to be okay? I don't know if there's a problem here, Ari. I mean, we just need to find the nature of morality, maybe this is it. Do you honestly believe that? Do you think that morality is found in the rules dictators enforce? Well, no. Well then, keep looking. There has to be a flaw in his argument somewhere. Are you two quite done chatting over there? Yes, Arbiter, sorry. Hobbes, you may have thought thought through my previous challenges, but my life depends on my only accepting the nature of morality, and somehow I just can't accept that this is it. Hmm. <laughs> Humbug. Very well, Mr. Jones. I have all the time in the world. Examine away. Oh, god. The music is, like, more intense now. This is scary. Okay. Uh... Okay, so contract needs to be enforced. Every contract requires obligations powerful enough to enforce its morals. Okay. Interesting, I don't... Okay, so let me just look through these... real quick. Okay, maybe I want him to, to define sovereign, maybe? 
Like, if you can elaborate on the word sovereign, I think. What do you mean by this exactly? Simple. The people give power to a ruler who is able to enforce the contract. By give power, you mean you form an agreement with? Indeed. As in a contract. Yes, in exchange for the power, he grants order and protection. Interesting. Oh, okay, we got something new out of that. Okay, so the, the Sovereign forms a contract with the people to enforce their rules. Hmm. Something weird about this statement. Hold on. Wait, so is he saying that... That the contract enforces rules, but also that contracts themselves need to be enforced? Ah, oh, that sounds so convoluted. But I think this might be it, I don't know. Uh, okay. I might be wrong, but... Hobbes. I will admit that your philosophy is very interesting from a political perspective. But, as a basis of morality, it simply won't stand. Nonsense. Mr. Jones, even now you lack sensible qualities such as fear. Haven't you learned how to not- not to make such brash statements? Nonsense! Brash? This time, I think not. Boys, enough grandstanding, get to the point. Ugh. Hobbes, you said that the source of our obligation to the social contract is in the pressures laid upon us by the Sovereign, is that correct? Yes. And the Sovereign's power to apply such pressures come from a contract between him and the people, yes? Absolutely. Well then, Hobbes, answer me this. What obligates the king to follow his contract with the people? Exactly. Oh, okay. You may have added a layer of obligation, Hobbes, but you haven't fixed anything. The problem is exactly the same. The king, being selfish, will take advantage of his people. And we are back to where we started. No matter. Just another moment of your time, and I will lay out what binds the king to his contract. Wait, there's more? Nonsense! Oh. I don't need to hear it, Hobbes. What? What? How dare you? The fact is, we can do this forever. I can continue to point out the lack of obligation in your mor morality, and you can attempt to provide a source. You are curing the symptoms and not the disease. The question you need to answer is not what obligates the king. If the source of obligation is, so is the social contract, then it can only be another contract. Instead, answer me this. What obligates us to keep our contracts? What makes them the source of morality? Can you answer this, Hobbes? I... I... well... Dad! You've actually stumped him. This is the core of your problem, Hobbes. Morality based in contracts leads to an infinite regression of obligations. Thus, it can't possibly be the true source. Wow, Dad. Let's hear him- let's see him counter that. Well, Hobbs? How can something that requires obligation be the source of all obligation? It just doesn't make any sense. Your philosophy is- is hobbled, Hobbs. Nice one. Well, you see, preposterous, the sovereign will, uh, uh... The fear, I... Uh, it, it creates uh, in us a uh, mechanical drive to to. Uh, I I I I I. Oh, good God! I think we broke him. Um, Socrates, do you know what my last words were before I died? Now I am about to take my last voyage, a great leap into the dark. I desired rest, a life finally free from fear and discomfort. I did not wish to be trapped in this realm, debating for all eternity. Accepting the Arbiter's challenge was a foolish choice, Mr. Jones, but needless to say, I can understand why you did so. 
And, ignorant as you are, you have given me reason to re-examine my principles. I shall now take my leave. Okay, so I guess that was chapter three. And I somehow didn't mess up this time, so maybe I'm getting better at this, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> maybe next time we can find out a bit more about uh, Socrates and the whole mystery going on there. Uh, we'll see. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.